Dear students here present on site and dear online participants, I very much welcome you to the third lecture to the series Strengthening EU Environmental Law, Legal Perspectives on Greening Europe. Our lecturer today is Professor Helle Tekner Anker, Professor of Law at Copenhagen University, Denmark. As you can see, we have tried to get a geographic distribution of speakers, as we have started with Michael Faure from Belgium, followed by Fabrizio Fraccia from Italy. The next speakers are after the lecture today, on the 1st of June, then we will welcome Julia Bandi from Hungary. But today, the words will come from Denmark, since Helle will deliver her lecture online. My colleague Helle Techner Anker is well known among EU environmental law colleagues since she provides important perspectives on core topics on EU environmental law, such as competences. One of her recent publications is on the difficult topic on how to align EU species protection with the challenge of wind energy establishments an article which she has co-authored with another professor from Denmark, Brigitte Eglund also. Also, Brigitte Eglund also will deliver a lecture in the series. Today, Helle will focus at EU competences and the energy crisis, focusing on renewables, biodiversity and energy security. I am very glad, Helle, that you have accepted to cooperate to this lecture series and I invite you to take the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for organizing this uh, lecture series on the strengthening of EU law. Uh, so I'm very honored and happy to give a presentation um, on the EU competence and the energy crisis. Well, as you all know, um, the EU is facing an energy crisis, uh, partly on the sad background of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, the energy crisis has prompted several EU initiatives, including also initiatives to promote or rather to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy, in particular wind and solar power. And some of these initiatives, in particular what is called the uh, emergency regulation, uh, to some extent sets aside uh, the EU legislation on biodiversity. And uh, this raises some question about the competence of the EU in view of this apparent conflict between energy security and biodiversity concerns. So these are the issues that I um, uh, seek to address in, in this presentation. So first, uh, just an outline. We'll start off with a bit on competence uh, in general and uh, then look more closely into these um, what I call novel competence approaches linked to the energy crisis um, and the sidestepping of uh, environmental law, uh, the purpose to accelerate the deployment of renewables. Um, so there are actually two initiatives uh, with the more or less the same content. Uh, but with a different competence approach. Uh, so the first one is the proposal from May 2022 to amend the Renewable Energy Directive. And uh, then in November 2022, there was a proposal for an emergency regulation to accelerate the deployment of renewable energy. Um, and uh, the latter was adopted in, in December 2022. So I will focus on this emergency regulation. Um, and it was adopted under a separate legal basis, namely Article 122, which, um, but on the temporary basis, it seeks to achieve the same purpose as the amendment of the Renewable Energy Directive. So to speed up the permit granting procedures for renewables um, by uh, sort of uh, trying to um, set aside uh, some of the uh, requirements in EU environmental legislation, particularly on the um, questions of uh, protection of biodiversity on, in the Habitats Directive and the Birds Directive. So, um, finally, 
some points for discussion on the strengthening of EU environmental law, since that's the sort of uh, general topic of this uh, lecture series. Um, perhaps it seems a little bit strange uh, following up to um, talking about initiatives that seems to um, uh, set aside EU environmental legislation, but uh, it perhaps in particular on that back background, it could be relevant to, to discuss the, what went wrong, if something went wrong, uh, since the EU apparently feels that there is a need to set aside environmental legislation. So, on the, on the competence in general, um, I trust that, that most of you are familiar with the general principles, uh, on that determines the powers of the EU in TEU Article 5, the principle of conferral, subsidiarity, and proportionality. Um, I think today when we talk about environment and energy and lots of other issues, it's not so much a question of whether the EU can legislate or um, adopt measures, but more a question of how the EU can legislate. So it's more a question of what competences that, that has been uh, conferred to the EU. Um, and the choice of legal basis uh, so often uh, determines the, the scope of the EU competence, for example, whether it's a minimal harmonization or total harmonization uh, measures. But in general, the lawmaking procedure is the same uh, under the most of the legal basis. How, so there's not so much conflict about the lawmaking procedures as we uh, used to have uh, in earlier days. But there are some exceptions. And uh, these exceptions come into play also in relation to this emergency regulation. And uh, these exceptions or also reflect the complex relations, not only between the member states and the EU, but also between the EU institutions and perhaps more importantly in this context between different sectoral competences, for example, uh, energy security versus uh, environment and biodiversity. Um, so I, I would say that these competence struggles are, uh, well, they're not easily uh, divided uh, but so they overlap and there are some blurred boundaries. But if we look in particular at the, um, the question of legal basis and competence when there is a perceived need to set aside EU legislation on the protection of the environment, for example, uh, the Natura 2000 rules that we have in the Habitats and Birds Directive um, and also the uh, Species Protection Rules in the same directives, then uh, it's relevant to go into this um, discussion of, of the, uh, the relevant legal basis. So an example of such um, issues or such complex relations have been uh, the case in, in many member states, but this is a case from Denmark, from the northern part of Denmark on the west coast, where we have a wind energy project uh, for 18 turbines, which are located just next to 100 meters from a Natura 2000 site. And the Natura 2000 site is designated for the protection of several birds, including the hen harrier. So in this case, um, the local authority had to adopt the necessary plans and make an EIA assessment under the Habitats Directive. Um, and they did so, um, and in 2018, they adopted the relevant plans and uh, also an EIA permit. However, there were uh, some concerns that they had not looked uh, sufficiently into, in, uh, in particular, the effects on birds, including the hen harrier, and there were appeals to the Danish Appeals Board. And in 2021, uh, the Danish appeals boards uh, turned down the, the plans and the EIA for not being sufficiently precise and complete, in particular as regards the hen harrier, and thereby not fulfilling the rather strict criteria of the Court of Justice of removing all reasonable scientific doubt as to the potential adverse effects of this, these uh, wind turbines on birds. So, New assessments are now being made uh, and new plans uh, being adopted. And perhaps, 
perhaps we will have another uh, appeal case. Um, and uh, in this case, it might again be the Natura 2000 um, uh, legislation or the Habitat Directive. It could also be the Species Protection. Uh, it appears that there are also bats in this area. So we might have another round of appeals and another um, possibility of delay in um, in getting uh, the permits adopted for this um, this uh, wind energy installation. So yeah, I believe that it's cases like this um, in the member states that form the background for the EU initiatives to speed up the permit granting procedures. But it might not be as easy um, as you could think, um, uh, reflecting these um, complex and blurred boundaries as regards the EU competence. So if we just look at what are the potential legal basis when we talk about environment and energy um, in the TFEU, of course, we have Article 192 uh, for environment um, measures. Uh, and also the distinction between the uh, ordinary legislative procedure in general and then the special legislative procedure for some specific uh, circumstances where, uh, such as town and country planning, and more importantly in this respect, measures significantly affecting a member state's choice between different energy sources and the general structure of its energy supply. Uh, so there are some reservations in the EU competence uh, reflected in the, the need for a special legislative procedure when it comes to these um, uh, measures that may affect uh, the choice between different energy sources. Uh, this is also reflected in the specific uh, 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 article uh, for energy measures in Article 194, which was introduced by the um, Lisbon Treaty. Here, it, it gives the EU the power to legislate, um, uh, but not in, in this case on members that affect, again, the right to determine conditions for exploiting its energy resources, member states, its choice between the energy sources and the general structure of its energy supply. So this means that in this case, the competence of the EU has been narrowed down within the, the area of energy. It doesn't mean that measures uh, to that may affect uh, uh, a member state's uh, choice between different energy uh, sources cannot be adopted, because they can be adopted under Article 192, Paragraph 2, under a special procedure, but then it must be a sort of environment-related uh, measures. Um, so there's an integrate in, integrate Kate, inter, interplay between these two different um, uh, articles uh, and legal basis in the treaty when it comes to energy, energy, environment related issues. However, there might also be other legal basis that can be used, for example, Article 114 on the internal market, it could be Article 43 on agriculture, Article 168 on, on health. Um, so and also considering the principle of integration as reflected in TFEU Article 11. However, uh, a new player uh, in the field is uh, Article 122, which was used as a legal basis for this uh, emergency regulation. Um, so, uh, and the question is whether Article 122, which sits in the domain of economic and monetary policy and provides the the, the possibility of adopting emergency measures, whether this is the appropriate legal basis for this emergency regulation aimed at speeding up um, uh, permit procedures for renewables. So before going more into the, um, the question of Article uh, 122, let's just have a look um, at the the situation, the the energy crisis um, that has prompted these uh, new approaches in the EU, uh, where we have seen the 
highly volatile prices and in particular the skyrocketing of energy prices in 2022 following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, however, not only the war has affected energy prices and it, it appears that multiple factors, including EU and national policies, uh, reducing reliance on fossil fuels and nuclear energy uh, has also uh, played a part in uh, in the rising energy prices. However, also increasing the reliance on Russian gas, but also climate conditions, weather conditions, severe droughts in parts of Europe affecting hydropower generation, uh, but also nuclear power due to uh, problems with the cooling. So. So this is, a, a, again, also a complex a mix of different factors uh, that affect um, the, uh, the electricity market or the energy market and it causes this energy crisis. And despite, despite some apparent improvements as regards the electricity prices, the EU has nevertheless felt the need to take action, including these more novel competence approaches. So. So what are these uh, these measures that the EU has, um, or these initiatives that has been taken by the EU? Well, first of all, the, um, the EU presented this Repower EU plan in March 2022. And uh, this plan also included the Commission proposal for amendment uh, of Renewable Energy Directive with the purpose to streamline and speed up permit granting procedures for renewable energy, uh, including uh, exemptions from EU environmental legislation. The, um, the proposal for amendment of the Renewable Energy Directive is subject to the ordinary legislative procedure, um, and it's, it's actually still pending. In October uh, 2022, the European Council uh, called for a fast tracking of uh, this simplification of permitting procedures for renewable energy. Apparently, they were of the opinion that it would uh, take too long to get the the amendment, the amendment of the Renewable Energy Directive adopted and uh, transposed and implemented in the member states. So they called for this emergency measure uh, in accordance with Article 122 of the TFEU. This resulted in a Commission proposal for uh, a Council emergency regulation in, adopted in November uh, 22. No, it was proposed in November 22 and then adopted uh, in December 22. So a very fast uh, procedure uh, for the adoption of this um, emergency uh, regulation. Before we look into the emergency regulation, I will just brief, briefly um, state what uh, was in the proposal for amendment of the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, well, first of all, it quite clearly states that the reasons or the, the background is the the belief that administrative barriers are increasingly becoming uh, important uh, obstacles, and in particular that certain conflicting public goods are becoming uh, a main source of ob obstacles, and specifying that the most prominent among them concern environmental protection, uh, and in particular biodiversity and protection of endangered species, and also protection of water bodies. So this is uh, the clearly stated uh, background and uh, of the uh, of the proposal for amendment of the renewable energy directive. And the content of this uh, directive is sort of uh, has there, there are sort of different ways of sidestepping uh, EU environmental uh, legislation. You could say that one is sort of a blank exemption, non-applicability of the EU rules, and this would apply in the so-called um, go-to areas for renewable energy, which the member states are supposed to designate. And in uh, these areas that should be subject to a strategic environmental assessment, 
there should be uh, extensions from the EIA directive and from the habitats directive. Uh, there's also um, a more conditioned exemption when it comes to the species protection of the birds and habitats directive, saying that if appropriate mitigation measures are adopted, then the killing or disturbance of species will not be considered deliberate, meaning that the prohibition against deliberate killing or disturbance would not apply. But that, again, that is linked to this requirement that appropriate mitigation measures should be taken. Uh, should be carried out. And then there's the third um, way of sidestepping, which is uh, linked to a general presumption that renewables is an overriding public interest, at least until climate neutrality has been achieved. Um, so the last one is sort of aimed at using the derogations in the Habitats and Birds Directive uh, where one of the conditions is that if there's overriding public interest, then under certain conditions, it is possible to derogate from the otherwise very strict protection of both Natura 2000 sites and uh, species. So the legal basis for this proposal for amendment of the Renewable Energy Directive is Article 194, Paragraph 2. Uh, but also Article 192, Paragraph 1. And it is explicitly stated that the need to include Article 192 is because the proposal uh, aims to amend the application of union environmental legislation. So the final adoption is uh, pending, but as far as I know, there was a provisional agreement uh, between Parliament and Council in March. Uh, so, um, so perhaps we will soon see what the what the result will be, or what uh, we have ended up with. So, um, what I mentioned here as, the, as regards the content was what was proposed, um, but as far as I know, there has also been um, amendments proposed by both the Parliament and um, the Council. So, if we look into the emergency regulation. Then um, we again see uh, this quite clear statement that uh, the lengthy and complex administrative procedures have been identified as one of the key obstacles hampering the speed and number of investments in renewable energy. Um, and then uh, this regulation also quite clearly states the background in the energy crisis that endangers not only the economy in the EU, but also seriously threatens the security of supply. And also that this risk will persist regardless of any temporary reduction of the wholesale prices. So even though that the energy prices have started going down uh, in November 2022, then uh, there is still a perceived need to, um, to adopt these uh, urgency uh, measures. So, and what is the content of the emergency regulation? Well, first of all, it's only a temporary uh, emergency uh, measures uh, for 18 months. It was proposed to be only for 12 months, but it has been for 18 months. So starting 1st of January and applying to new projects um, subject to uh, permitting procedures uh, um, after the entry into force. Actually, the member states can also choose to apply the rules for um, ongoing uh, uh, permit procedures. But again, the main uh, content is this short-term acceleration of the permit granting procedures for renewable energy. And again, by extensions from the EU environmental legislation and also setting up certain time limits for specific types of renewable energy. Um, that was also uh, included, the time limits were also included in the proposal for amendment of the renewable energy directive. So I will come a little bit back to the, um, to the more specific parts on the, the biodiversity issues. So the legal basis for this uh, emergency regulation is Article 122, as mentioned before, uh, sits within the economic and monetary policy. Um, but 
given an opportunity to uh, adopt uh, urgent or emergency uh, measures uh, also when uh, the supply of energy uh, is um, uh, is affected. Let's look a little bit more into these uh, the biodiversity exemptions uh, uh, adopted under this uh, regulation. First of all, it has uh, this presumption of overriding public interest, serving public health and safety. So there's a presumption that the renewable uh, energy installations will be of overriding public interest. This paves the way for the use of the delegations in the habitats, birds, and, and water framework directives. Um, and it also indicates this priority in the balancing of uh, interests um, to towards the um, overriding public interest of ensuring uh, uh, or accelerating deployment of renewable energy. However, for when it comes to the species protection, then uh, it says that for prote protected species, this priority should only uh, take place if appropriate species conservation measures to ensure a favorable conservation status at population level have been undertaken, undertaken and that financial resources are made available for that purpose. So that's like one uh, way of sidestepping sort of uh, through the derogations in the habitats and birds directives. Uh, another way is the uh, that member states can exempt renewable energy from the EIA directive and from the species protection of the habitats and birds directive for what is here called dedicated renewable or grid areas. So that would be the same as the go-to areas uh, in the proposal for amendment of the renewable energy directive. Provided that these, the designation of these areas has been subjected to a strategic environmental assessment and that appropriate mitigation measures have been adopted regarding species. There are also some exemptions for EIA requirements as regards solar energy uh, placed on artificial structures, for example, on roofs. Um, and uh, when it comes to repowering of, uh, for example, uh, wind um, energy projects, then the EIA uh, is confined to the additional impact compared to what was in place already. So, so this is what is in the, the regulation. So, but if we look at how these biodiversity extensions are likely to work in practice and how the rules are in the, the habitats directed, um, it might look a little bit uh, more complicated uh, than from the face of it, from the emergency regulation. For example, if we look at the Natura 2000 sites, which are sites uh, uh, designated for the protection of birds, uh, Annex 1 birds uh, under the Birds Directive, and sites uh, designated for the protection of habitat types and species under the Habitats Directive. These Natura 2000 sites are subject to a very strict protection. Any plan, uh, under Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive, any plan or plan or project that may potentially affect the sites or the species that, are, that they are designated for protection of should be subject to a full assessment of the potential effects uh, and cannot be allowed on this uh, or can only be allowed if there's uh, no reasonable scientific doubt as to the absence of adverse effects. So these are very strict criteria that are set by the Court of Justice of the EU in several court rulings on, on the Habitats Directive. Um, so, but there is a derogation option. The derogation option is in Article 6.4 uh, of the Habitats Directive, setting three conditions for a derogation. One is the imperative reasons of overriding public interests. Two is the absence of alternative solutions. And Three, that all compensatory measures are taken. So this means that it's not enough to consider uh, renewables and overriding public interest. These other conditions have to be fulfilled as well. 
uh, and in particular, it's difficult to um, say, for example, if you talk about uh, putting up renewable uh, uh, or putting up uh, wind turbines, um, well, there could be a lot of alternatives. Um, so the question is, what would actually be the options of using the derogations uh, for, for example, uh, wind turbines? Also, it, it should be kept in mind that um, Article 6, 4, so the derogation can only apply after the implications of a project have been analyzed in accordance with Article 6, 3. So this means that using the derogation is not an exemption from making a full uh, assessment of the potential effects of uh, the renewable energy installation on the Natura 2000 sites and uh, and the species uh, that the sites uh, are designated for the protection. And the court has argued that this knowledge of the sort of profound knowledge and assessment of these implications is a necessary prerequisite for considering, for example, what would be the uh, relevant compensatory measures. Um, you need to identify what is the potential damage on the site. So. And this has been stated uh, by the court, for example, in this case, which was about a development project in the port of Antwerp, um, where the uh, Belgian authorities had tried to sort of establish, uh, or expand or restore a site, the Natura 2000 site, before the adoption uh, of the project plans. This was not accepted uh, by the Court of Justice under Article 6.3, but 6.4 could be an option, but again, provided that a full assessment had been made under Article 6.3. And the requirements for uh, uh, an Article 6.3 assessment is also, according to the court, that it must contain complete, precise, and definitive findings capable of removing all reasonable scientific doubt as to the effects um, on uh, the Natura 2000 site. So, so that's is and that is the challenge um, in uh, decision making or permit granting procedures for renewables uh, such as wind energy, for example, if we have uh, bird uh, bird protection sites um, nearby, or it could also be further away, uh, as a wind uh, farm may affect also um, bird populations uh, in the two or three thousand sites that are not located right next to. Uh, to the wind farm. So, in practice, it means that the member states, even though uh, renewables could be are an overriding uh, uh, public interest, they cannot. Member states cannot ex escape the demanding assessment requirements, and they must fill, fulfill these conditions, and they must make a full assessment. So, the presumption that this alone will speed up procedures is uh, perhaps uh, doubtful. Uh, yeah, it might uh, reduce appeals, uh, but uh, but we'll see whether that uh, is what's going to happen. So when we look into the species protection um, uh, of, in particular, birds and bats, um, then the birds directive and the habitat directive article 12 both uh, have a prohibition against deliberate uh, killing uh, or disturbance and uh, and also a derogation option so for the prohibition uh, there's also a very strict interpretation by the court of justice for example uh, reflected in this uh, swedish case uh, on the um, uh, felling of trees, uh, uh, where the court has stated that deliberate includes not only intentional killing of a specimen, but also the acceptance of the possibility of such killing. So maybe it's not, uh, you do not intend to um, harm uh, birds or other species if you fell the trees or if you put up a wind turbine, but nevertheless, uh, you probably accept the possibility that some birds or some bats might be killed uh, uh, due to the 
to the wind turbines. Uh, so, so this uh, prohibition uh, uh, would uh, apply uh, in uh, in most cases. Also, the court has stated that the prohibition cannot be made dependent upon whether the species is at some level of risk or are suffering a long-term decline in population. So this means that that you cannot take into account, and member states cannot take into account whether um, uh, how the, the population, the species population is, whether it's thriving or whether it's uh, threatened. The prohibition will apply uh, in in both circumstances, uh, and this is really something that can make it very difficult uh, to deal with the, the birds directive and uh, also the habitats directive when it comes to bats. All bats are protected under the habitat habitats directive. Also, bats that might be more common um, and and not threatened uh, and Actually, all wild birds are protected under Article 5 uh, of the Bird Directive. Uh, so this is a this is the challenge uh, in in the decision making. Uh, the derogation option in the Bird Directive Article 9 and Habitat Directive Article 6 is again that certain specific reasons, for example, public health and safety, and this is what is addressed in the emergency regulation saying that that is the presumption that renewables will fulfill this uh, requirement. But also here, the derogation requires that there should be no other satisfactory solution. And some investigations will be needed to demonstrate that that is not the case. Um, so, so the derogations in the regulations uh, or the re exemptions in the regulations is that the member states can use the derogation if there are appropriate conservation measures at population level. So making clear that it can be uh, assessed uh, at the population, or the effects can be assessed at the population level. Uh, and then there is the exemption from the prohibition in the dedicated renewable or grid areas if appropriate mitigation measures uh, have been adopted. There are no criteria for the designation of such areas and uh, since this is only a temporary um, measure, uh, it's it's a bit uncertain what requirements would actually be imposed on the member states for saying that something is a dedicated renewable or grid area, and in particular, what requirements would have been uh, or what uh, requirement the requirements would have been to assess the potential effects on. Natura 2000 sites and species before um, designating this area as a potential renewable or grid area. So there's a potential for a relatively wide discretion, uh, wide scope for the member states as regards the use of um, these um, designations. So turning back to the competence issue. Uh, so what is uh, what is the competence of the EU uh, when it comes to this emergency regulation? Well, the legal basis is Article 122.22, which says uh, that uh, the Council, on a proposal from the Commission, may decide upon measures appropriate to the economic situation, in particular if severe difficulties arise in the supply of certain products, notably, notably in the area of energy. So the question is now, should these, should the measures and objectives of, of the uh, regulation be economic and monetary measures and objectives? Or can they also include, which we probably should say that the measures in this emergency regulation are primarily environmental measures because they are related to the permit uh, granting processes and to environmental legislation. Uh, but is it then sufficient that the objectives as stated in the emergency regulation is um, uh, to um, is an economic objective uh, to address the energy crisis? Uh, so so that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, issue or interesting question. Uh, 
And if we look into uh, sort of the general um, approach uh, when it comes to the choice of legal basis, then the court has uh, stated in several cases that the choice of legal basis must be based on objective factors, which are amenable to judicial review, and include in particular the aim and content of the mission. Uh, so, if it's environmental, the environment is, is the objective, then it should be Article 192. If it's energy, Article 194. Uh, etc. Uh, if there is a multiple or more than one uh, objective, then the court has uh, applies this center of gravity test, saying that well, then you need to identify what is the main purpose uh, or component of the uh, the legal act to identify the relevant legal basis. Uh, in general, the court has been reluctant to accept more than one legal basis. Nowadays, when it's more or less the same, uh, or the ordinary legislative procedure is used in, in uh, for most legal basis, then we also see uh, quite a few uh, legal acts adopted on with more than one legal basis. However, if you have to choose, um, as was the case in this uh, this uh, old case on the waste directive. Um, between the council, the commission, and the council, the um, the commission um, challenged uh, the adoption uh, on the basis of what is now Article One Hundred Fourteen, arguing that uh, uh, Article One Hundred Thirty S should be the but no Article One Hundred Thirty S is the relevant legal basis um, and. Uh, but it was argued that it could have been adopted under Article 114. In this case, the, com the court said, well, recourse to Article 100A, now 114, is not justified where the measure to be adopted has only the incidental effect of harmonizing market condition. So if it's only like an incidental effect on the internal market, then it is not enough to justify the use of Article 114 as a legal basis. So, but again, we have some blurred boundaries here. So, again, is it the stated objective that are decisive? Or can we also look into the intended effects? Um, and in this case, on looking, we're looking into the potential effects of a measure adopted by the EU. We also have the case. Uh, Poland against the European Parliament and Council, which related to um, the adoption of a market stability reserve under the EU emission, tra emission trading schemes, which would um, basically take out emission allowances to ensure a better functioning of the emission trading scheme. And that would lead to an increase uh, of the allowances, um, increase in the price of the allowances. Sorry, that's important. Um, in this case, Poland argued that the potential effects of the market stability reserve would affect Poland's choice between different sources, uh, energy sources, and also the general structure of its energy supply. So, primarily due to the heavy reliance on coal and lignite, which would be severely affected by an increase in the price of emission allowances. So, Poland's argument was that adopting this uh, Market stability reserve under Article 192, paragraph 1 was the wrong legal basis. It should have been Article 192, paragraph 2, and thereby it should have been the Special Legislative Procedure and Unanimity in Council. Um, the court, however, did not uh, um, accept these arguments uh, by Poland, and in fact, the court quite um, uh, explicitly uh, rejected um, that sort of effect, effects based approach or effects uh, based factors were um, uh, acceptable uh, because it would in no way be objective factors amenable to judicial review as the effects only would occur after the adoption of the uh, legislation. So this was uh, quite clearly dismissed uh, by the court that um, uh, this sort of more effects-based uh, argument uh, 
uh, that Poland tried to um, put forward. So again, and the court says that it is the aim and content uh, of the act that is decisive. So looking into it, what is, the, what is decisive when we talk about the choice of legal basis? Well, first of all, um, uh, an objective examination of the real content and character of the measure and its linkages to the aims pursued by the relevant legal basis. So what is the real content and character of regulation, uh, the emergency regulation? Well, it's about the permit granting procedures for renewables, and it's about uh, sidestepping or making exemptions from EU environmental legislation. So uh, something that uh, reasonably could be characterized as environmental measures, uh, which would normally fall under Article 122 of the TFEU. However, when we look into the aim or objective of the measure, then we can see that, well, there are these economic uh, objectives. There's the objective of energy security, uh, but also the balancing of energy security and biodiversity. And this, of course, uh, makes it more difficult to determine whether Article 122 is uh, uh, an appropriate legal basis for this regulation or not. And also the apparent need for uh, temporary or emergency uh, measures. So, not necessarily a clear answer, um, uh, but that might, might actually also be one more issue or more issues to take into consideration. So this uh, this question about what kind of legal act uh, are we talking about in this regulation has been ra raised in a request for an internal review of the emergency regulation by two NGOs uh, under the Aarhus Convention. So, and they question whether the regulation is a legislative or a non-legislative act. Um, um, say, referring to the procedure uh, in Article 122 and also to the definition of legislative acts in Article 289 of the TFEU, saying that special legislative procedure is where the Parliament um, uh, adopts, decides with participation of the Council, or where the Council um, decides with participation of the Parliament. And in Article 122, there's no um, participation of the Parliament. It was the Council alone that uh, decided. So, but whether we can sort of uh, uh, take this sort of uh, definition of legislative acts or sort of granted is, um, uh, yeah, I would say that that is an interesting question. And also when we talk about non-legislative acts, we often talk about the delegated or implementing acts. Uh, and we have specific um, procedures for that under Article 219 and 291. Uh, but if this emergency regulation should be considered a non-legislative act, then we would have the question whether a non-legislative act could actually sidestep or set aside environmental legislative acts. So, so, so it will be interesting to see what the what response the council come up comes up with in, in following this uh, this request. Uh, just the last point. Um, so you could of course also take into account the principle of subsidiarity and the principle of subsidiarity and discuss that in relation to the competence uh, of uh, the EU. Um, of course, the member states cannot make exemptions or sidestep EU environmental legislation on their own. Um, but on the other hand, sort of the project related balancing is very much sort of a, something that needs a careful consideration and assessment at local level. Also, the principle of proportionality. You could uh, uh, discuss whether these measures in the emergency regulation are suitable, necessary, and not going beyond what is needed to achieve the objectives. And you could uh, ask whether uh, this regulation will, in effect, actually be capable of speeding up uh, the permit granting procedure. So, 
final slide um, on the strengthening of uh, EU environmental law. Uh, are these uh, novel competence approaches to sidestep environmental legislation? Are they a threat to environmental law, or is it merely simple politics uh, without a real effect? Uh, yeah. Uh, again, uh, perhaps I'm uh, raising more questions than giving answers, uh, but it might also um, uh, make us think about whether there's a need to reconsider environmental legislation to avoid getting uh, sidestepped in unfortunate manners. Did we miss something? Has the interpretation of, for example, the Habitats and Birds Directive become too narrow? So now that the balancing of interest and relevant concerns, including energy security and climate change, has become more or less uh, impossible. Well, we do have the derogations, but can the derogations be used more extensively in the habitats and first directive? That doesn't sit well with the general interpretation of derogations. So maybe we should re should uh, look more into this how to in incorporate uh, energy security concerns into EU environmental law and how to reconcile energy security and biodiversity concerns. Would that rather be through a revision uh, of the Habitats and Birds Directive, considering very carefully how to how to deal with this um, uh, or possibly uh, through a revision of the treaties providing a more clear uh, legal basis, perhaps also a legal basis for urgency measures within uh, environment and energy uh, areas. Yes, I think that was uh, <coughs> what I had for this presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. A big applause uh, for you. We are coming from the here. Yes, we live in difficult times where difficult decisions have to be made about uh, conflicting public goods. You have clearly set out the the applicable uh, laws uh, on uh, emergency measures, on the biodiversity laws, um, and indeed we have to go into the content of the laws in order to understand how things have been arranged. But I'm very happy, Helen that you concluded also with the fundamental question. So how to reconcile then uh, biodiversity concerns and energy uh, challenges, how to do so. And uh, on your final slide, you, you pointed at uh, revision, revision of uh, directives uh, uh, and perhaps a treaty uh, provision. And that puts indeed uh, the emphasis on uh, the the democratic dimension of uh, setting norms. Uh, so then it would be uh, the EU legislator if we talk about revision of uh, directives. Um, and um, of course, Hal has also referred to, to the case law uh, and it will be very interesting because cases are becoming up, how this will play out. Like will the legislator uh, reconcile and solve the conflicting uh, uh, concerns or will the courts step in uh, uh, there? Big question mark. So, Helle, I'm very grateful on this lecture that must have cost a lot of preparation time because we are talking about new laws. It's not easy to understand them. And thank you so much for having uh, set this out.